I will introduce the speakers in speaking order, and they will join us either in stage or virtually. Our first presenter is Christina Paulova from the Czech University of Life Science in Prague. Uh, speaking next is Annalena Lorenz with a team from the Leibniz University Hanover in Germany. And our third speaker is Pato Smith from the University of Florida. Let's begin with um, our first speaker, Christina Palova. She is a teaching librarian at the Czech University of Life Science, has tried various library activities, but eventually became passionate about making the world more information literate. In addition to her work at the university, she is also the chair of the professional group for information education and information literacy at the Association of Czech University Libraries. Currently, she is also working on a project dedicated to, develop, to developing interlibrary cooperation on blended learning and a media education project for high school students and seniors. Help me now welcome to the stage, Christina Paulova. Thank you very much and welcome. Good morning. My name is uh, Christina Paulova and as is already been said, I'm a teaching librarian. And in the next few minutes, I would like to introduce our new initiative to stop predatory practice. But I'll start with a story for the beginning. Some time ago, uh, we were looking for a new colleague to our library for the position of open science coordinator. And it was someone who helped academics and students navigate through the world of open science, inform about the benefits, warn about the risks, of the fair data, open data, and so on. And one of the candidates was truly special. It was uh, a scientist from our university. We asked each candidate if they know what the predatory publishers are. And he replied, sure, I know. They contact me frequently, but I only publish with those who are not full predators, but only half predators. They have an impact factor, for example. So I earn points and credits uh, for publishing. So it's all good. I've already published 10 articles this year. So if I were to publish only in a quality journals, better ones, I couldn't do it. Well, surprisingly, we didn't hire him for this position. And story goes on. Later, in a meeting with some other scientists, I mentioned that we might should focus on avoiding publishing in predatory journals. And scientists were quite surprised. They, repl they replied that they were know about the predatory journals and predatory practices, but it's not a problem in our university. After all, nobody at our university publishes in predatory journals, so we don't have to deal with it, yeah? Well, they either didn't know about the problem or it was a prime example of one of the most widely used problem solving strategies, denial. A few months later, I got a request from one of the university departments. They would like to publish in open access journals, but They've had heard it was uh, full of low quality journals and predators one and yeah, it was bad. So uh, they asked me if I could supply them a list of quality ones. Um, all they needed was the social science and educational fields. So easy peasy, no? Well, <laughs> in our view, any lists are a dangerous simplification. A list will never be complete. It will never be completely accurate. And moreover, it shifts the responsibility 
for decisions from the author to the list maker. But ultimately, the consequences of publishing will be carried by the author. So that's a problem. And we decided to never make any lists for anyone. No, thank you. Well, I took away uh, one big lesson from this. We have a problem. We have scientists who see nothing wrong with publishing in predatory journals. We have scientists who have no idea uh, that there is anything wrong with us. And we have scientists who want to publish, but they don't know how and where. Yes, we have a problem. It's not a good thing, but I think that accepting the fact that we have a problem is the first step to solving it. So it's not a completely bad thing at all, but how to solve it? We are a group of teaching librarians, so we can't solve everything, but we can contribute and we do that by doing what we do best, education, educating uh, the research community. And our plan, this education, was even supported by the IAP organization, which was great. We probably would have done it anyway, but it was a really nice bonus, so, you know. The primary outcome of our solution our project uh, was the creation of open teaching module. And it is this module I would like to offer you today for free use. But before we set about creating the module, uh, we wanted to find out it was just us who had a problem and if not, uh, what problems they had elsewhere. And I would like to ask you, is this a problem for you too, the predatory journals? Just, can just, like, or no, just raise your hand. No predatory journals at your universities, no publishing. Oh, so maybe it's just us. Um, well, we wanted uh, that our teaching module reflects the real world. And so we, uh, organized an open discussion. And we were quite surprised uh, in the interest in the discussion. Over 50 scientists, librarians, and other professionals, uh, PhD candidates, came together to debate the topic of predatory practices in science. And here you can see uh, what was discussed in my country. The most important issue for scientists was how to identify a predatory journal. We expected that. However, the very second theme was how to spot a shady journal. Those journals cannot be 100% said to be predatory, but are more or less likely to use some predatory practices. And that's why we no longer rely on some block lists like bill lists and so, um, because we have to consider different features and a combination for each journal, for each situation. And the fact that a journal has an impact factor, for example, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's quality one, uh, trustworthy one. And that suddenly makes every publishing process much more complex thing. There was also a sense from the debate of some scientists uh, wariness that fighting predators is a never ending process, never ending story. I can feel skepticism that anything is going to change anytime soon. Why try to publish in a trustworthy journal when a colleague with a different moral standards gets the same credit for publishing in a not so good journal? How to deal with a senior scientist 
who deliberately abuse the system. That's a problem. <coughs> and at the same time, the scientists at the discussion answered themselves by having the courage to speak out and highlight the problem. If we want change, we need to do something about it. Approach grant providers, uh, approach the science councils, and point out the issue at our universities. And I felt that the debate collectively motivated the attendees to find that courage. Uh, because they are all dealing with the same thing. They are not alone in this. <clears throat> yes, there is a, uh, oh, sorry. There is also a very detailed report published in <coughs> uh, the Nodo repository. And you can find the link uh, at the end of the presentation. Notably, uh, the debate has been about content of teaching module <clears throat> and what format it should have. And so we prepared a module tailored to our scientists. The module itself covered uh, four main topics, open access in general, pub predatory publishing, how to spot predators, and predatory conferences. We add one more chapter about what to do when you published, already published uh, in predatory journal, what to do for scientists, because that's a problem for us too. The module has uh, three parts, a comprehensive and detailed PowerPoint presentation uh, is supplemented by transcript of the spoken word and many other references. This presentation is modular, uh, meaning that each lecturer can choose a certain part and skip the others. And we even don't recommend to use it at the whole because it will be too long and overwhelm the students. Um, it is much better so, to select only a certain part and supplement it with exercises. Because we have also created uh, five exercises, uh, suggestions for exercises. Um, they are based on constructivist education and um, they are quite complex. <clears throat> the final section is a methodological guide for lecture on how to use the whole learning module and our suggestions on how to incorporate it into existing teaching. The entire thing is designed with the idea that even a lecturer who is new to the subject should be able to do a good job with our teaching module. And now we could try one of the exercises if, if you want to. Here you can see two print screens of Yoku Journal. And I want to ask you if you can spot the predatory one. What do you think? It is A or B? I give you a minute. And I know it's a small picture for you. So you have to just guess. What do you think? Who thinks it's A? Can you raise your hand? It's A. Thank you. A. And B, yeah, thank you. And I have to say the B is predatory one. And to all who guess it wrong, I guess it wrong at the beginning too, at the first time. It's quite harsh because the first one seems almost too good, too modern to be original one. This is one of the exercises, but students have to do much more than guessing. They have to do deeper analysis. They have to analyze the ISSN and impact factor and <coughs> in which databases is the articles from, this, uh, from these articles, from these journals. 
um, <clears throat> if you're interested in more, just open the page uh, of our initiative and check it, check out module. Uh, we'll be very glad if it doesn't go unused. Remember those scientists who didn't believe at the beginning that we have a problem at all. After my colleague and I got a little bit motivated to bring it up again and again, the situation shifted. The same people no longer dismiss the problem. They ask for deep analysis. We have meetings with them um, and they are trying to find out more. And some of them are already preparing new methodologies and um, new guidelines for their departments. So things are moving, but sometimes a bit slow, but moving. My presentation is maybe a little bit different because our initiative started at the beginning of this year as a short three months project. And we originally planned to create a teaching module and just stopped <laughs> and finished. But during and after the project, we were approached by researchers from different departments all across our country. And they asking us what we do, what we would do next, what we are planning. They that they would like to be involved in our initiative somehow uh, because it was badly needed. Scientists often more experienced in the field than us uh, asked how they can help us to change the system to make it more resistant to predatory practices. And we think that since there's such a demand to keep our initiative going, uh, it would be a bad idea to stop it. And from the discussion, uh, we have plenty of tips on where to focus and also plenty of contacts uh, in the scientific community uh, that we can reach out for help and we definitely will do it. So we will see what the future brings us. And that's almost all. Thank you for your attention. And here you can see the links, I promised, to our uh, initiative and for the report from our discussion. There's also a flyers at the first row, so don't be hesitate to take them and take it with you home. Thank you much. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Annalena Lorenz with a team from the Leibniz University Hanover, and the work is titled University Libraries and the Open Research Knowledge Graph. Annalena Lorenz works as our community manager for the Open Research Knowledge Graph. Before joining Deep Hanover, she earned her PhD in theoretical physics while also participating in a teaching project for academic libraries, academic literacies. Being a former researcher herself, she knows how important data management and good scholarly communication are, which motivated her to join the ORKG team. Please, Annalena Lorenz. The floor is yours. Okay, um, thanks for your nice introduction and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present our open research knowledge graph um, and its possible um, collaborations with libraries today. So, um, and before I want to start um, talking about actual science and actually scholarly communication, um, I want you to take a step back and think about um, the way digitalization change, changes how we perform certain tasks in our everyday lives. For example, if you wanted to come and visit me at TIB in Hanover, where we develop the ORKG, 50 years ago, you would have to um, go to a store and buy a map of Hanover. Then you would have to try to spot uh, Hanover, uh, the TIB in Hanover. And then you could go through the roads and memorize the driving instructions. And then you could visit me at TIB. If you want to do the same thing today, 
it's fortunately a lot easier because you can just take your navigation app, uh, your favorite one, enter TAB Hanover, and you will get detailed um, instructions how to go there. And you can just directly go um, yeah, with the phone you have with you probably anyways. But not only that, but we also gain additional features. For example, we can now zoom in around uh, the region of interest and look for other interesting places around. We can find additional information, for example, the opening hours of our TAB main building um, or where to grab, grab coffee nearby. Or we could get, also get a traffic jam warning um, while traveling there. So by taking the actual information, so which roads exist and where they lead and separating it from the analog medium, so the um, printed map and transferring it to a new digital medium, the navigation app, we don't only gain an exact um, a digital copy of the physical thing, but we gain something completely new. And um, the same thing can also be observed in other domains. For example, nobody would use a mail order catalog or printed out encyclopedias anymore or phone books. Um, we would now all just use um, the digital products for this. So basically whole industries got disrupted and our everyday lives were significantly changed. The way we perform certain tasks, how efficient we perform certain tasks, all of that was changed by digitalization. But what if we look at our everyday work lives or a scientist's everyday work life? Um, what does it look like there? So if we go back 300 years ago, um, we would have the first really scientific journals with uh, scientific articles. And if a scientist would have a finding there, um, the scientists would communicate it in such a written um, scientific article. Okay, a little further to our time, 100 years ago, around the time of Einstein, um, you would still have a printed out scientific article. Now you can see the um, print uh, evolved in that time, the techniques for printing evolved. Um, and also it's now um, fortunately English and no longer Latin. So um, I have an easier time understanding this. Um, that's uh, nice, but it's still mainly scient written scientific article. Okay, if we go further to 20 years ago, there were PDFs on the market, and now we have scientific articles in a PDF. And if we look at what changed until today, um, we still have scientific articles in a PDF on a website. So you could argue that over the course of 300 years, not much has changed uh, in the way we communicate our scientific findings. So yes, of course, we switched from printed out articles to PDF articles and PDFs got better over time, um, but the underlying mode of scholarly communication didn't change by that. So to compare it to our example from before, this would be like using a PDF scan of a map uh, instead of a navigation app. And um, nobody would do that. It's, just not as uh, convenient as using a navigation app. Uh, also, we miss out on a lot of additional features there. And um, yeah, so in, in our everyday lives, nobody would use that to just use the exact uh, digital copy of a physical thing. Um, but unfortunately, in our kind of everyday work lives uh, in scholarly communication, this is exactly what's happening. So you could argue <laughs> that science is currently not harvesting the full potential of digitalization. And the downsides of this uh, really show to scientists, um, as in the introduction it was said, I've been a former scientist myself. And um, there we really have the problem of this overwhelming flood of publications. So per year, it's uh, around 2.5 million new um, publications every year. Um, and it's impossible to keep track of the publications on the market. Um, so even in small fields, um, there are still so many publications that researchers often have a hard time to um, find information there. And they often feel overwhelmed just by the amount of papers that they would have to read to keep track over everything. Um, and in the worst case, this could lead to um, the loss of knowledge because maybe an article is simply not seen or there's not enough time to read every article. In addition, if you are not just looking for articles that exist, but if you want to answer specific questions, that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And I can show you an example for this. 
um, if you would be interested in the uh, genome editing technique CRISPR, and uh, you would search for articles on that um, on Google Scholar, you would find almost half a million results. So a lot of publications um, with this topic there. But now as a scientist, you're not uh, interested in just finding articles, but typically you want to answer specific question with these articles. So for example, who applied CRISPR to butterflies or how can I apply it with minimal costs for my lab or um, how does it compare to other genome editing techniques or something like that. And if you would now search for those answers in half a million articles, you would basically be lost because there's no time to read every article. And yes, you could uh, try a better keyword search and um, try to be a bit more specific in your keywords, but you would still have a huge amount of scientific articles there that you would basically have to read to answer your um, question. And um, this is more than just an inconvenience for us as scientists, um, but this is also really costing money. So globally, um, almost uh, around 1.7 trillion US dollars um, are spent on research and development. And a large share of this is then wasted in an inefficient system. So it costs time and money. And in addition for scientists, it's sometimes annoying. <laughs> So, okay, um, while this is maybe the um, most uh, immediate downside of this uh, publication flood, there are some further issues. Um, for example, this, um, this uh, publication flood uh, contributes um, to the uh, reproducibility crisis or this document orientation contributes to reproducibility crisis. It contributes to the deficiency of peer review because of course peer reviewers are also suffering under this publication flood. Then this focus on documents um, creates problems when we try to apply meaningful uh, machine assistance for scientists, because it's not that easy to do that on a basis of written text in the PDF. And also it's um, kind of easier to create um, a predate on a PDF than to do on the actual knowledge. So with all of these struggles and all of these problems, we believe that it's really time to rethink scholarly communication to better fit the challenges that we are now facing and in the future will be facing in science and uh, scholarly communication. And the solution is not to somehow just invent better PDFs, um, but similar to this quote, the light bulb was not invented by improving the candle we should really try to come up with a new system there in addition to our written articles. And for that, we say we want to digitalize knowledge and not just documents. And we want to do this with the open research knowledge graph. Um, as the name already implies, um, the ORKG in short is a knowledge graph. And uh, knowledge graphs are not some strange academic construct, but something we already encounter in our everyday lives. For example, um, in, when we Google something, there's a knowledge graph in the background working. If we ask Amazon Alexa a question, there's a knowledge graph in the background working. So something we already have in industry. And the idea is why not somehow use it for a good cause? Why not use it for uh, science and here, especially open science then? Um, so a bit about knowledge graphs um, and the differences in knowledge representations. So currently um, we present knowledge in uh, such papers here where we have written articles that are written by humans for humans and can mostly be understand by humans. Um, but if we display knowledge in a different way um, in such a graph that you can see on the right, um, we would go to a more machine actionable way of presenting knowledge. And on the right here, you can see an example of how the information that is in this paper on the left would be displayed in the knowledge graph. And there you can say, uh, see that you have um, some triples that are linked um, that where you have a subject and then an object and those are linked by a predicate there. So for example, for the metadata, um, you would have the statement that uh, Robert Reed is the author of this paper. But then we also want to go to actual content. For example, this paper addresses this problem and this paper has this result. This paper um, uses this data set for the evaluation. So to really construct uh, all the information that is uh, given um, in text form 
into this uh, knowledge graph, into this machine actionable representation there, into those statements. And uh, this representation of knowledge has some um, advantages there, uh, because as I said, it's then machine actionable. So this um, makes for completely new ways to automatically find and link relevant research contributions towards a specific problem. Um, so if you look to the picture here on the right-hand side, um, you can see um, if this orange thing here was our research question that we are interested in answering, you could uh, directly take the results from various different sources and combine them to an answer. Um, also, not only relevant contributions can be linked and combined, um, but also the graph structure would be the basis to, in the future, make natural language question um, answering possible. So, for example, like Googling for science, if you just want to Google your research question, um, there would be a graph structure needed um, to represent the knowledge and then to work in finding an answer. And with this graph based raised approach, um, scientists and librarians can then explore knowledge in entirely new ways, um, completely um, machine assisted and uh, just completely different from reading articles. And I have an example for that. Um, if you imagine you would have been a virologist uh, two years ago, your work would have probably been really stressful around uh, 2020. And you would um, probably have been interested in the basic reproduction number of uh, the coronavirus. And uh, traditionally, there you would have to read a lot of studies on that, a lot of different articles um, that you would basically have to uh, skim through the relevant information to get to your result for the basic reproduction number and compare it with others. So, but now in RKG, instead of all these articles, you just got this tabular comparison where different studies on the um, basic reproduction number are displayed here in those different columns and are um, <laughs> compared along those different properties automatically. For example, um, the location that the study was done in or which results the study got and how certain you are of the results. So all these studies are directly compared. And instead of um, having to read uh, all those uh, articles, I guess in total it were like 30 articles in this uh, table, I only screenshotted four because my screen isn't as large. And instead of reading all those over 30 articles, um, you could just get such a tabular overview where you could directly see the results there. And um, yeah, so this could really, this is an example um, where our graph approach, our RKG approach could really simplify work for scientists. And um, with the RKG, we follow a certain uh, set of goals. Um, as you've already um, seen, we want to provide researchers with an easier and quick overview over the state of the art for really specific research problems. Um, we want to foster collaborations between scientists and librarians who can then enter uh, information together and work on information together um, to really uh, yeah, get the best out of the system. Um, also, we believe that uh, this graph approach will help tackle interdisciplinary challenges uh, such as climate change research or disease prevention, where you would basically have information from various different sources. Um, we also want to help make research more fair, so according to the principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And in the end, we want to really shift the focus away from um, document and uh, somehow bibliometric indices, but rather towards actual scientific content there. And with this, we aim to um, yeah, so to say, to finally bring scholarly communication to the 21st century to deal with digital challenges. And uh, yeah, to complete the picture here, so to say, we want to be the lighthouse in the publication flood. Okay, so this is kind of our goal. Um, what is the ORKG currently able to do? Um, we provide a set of features. Um, you have already seen an example of our comparisons. Um, we provide those structured um, machine actionable descriptions of papers that you can then also use for your own systems and do whatever you want with them. 
um, we offer the possibility to visualize um, your uh, data if it's numeric data. Um, we offer the possibility to create uh, those dynamical uh, reviews that are easily changed if the underlying content changes, which is different from traditional review articles we have now. Um, we offer the list to collaboratively, uh, the, we offer the possibility to collaboratively um, create and work on lists of literature, software, and data sets, and uh, whatever you basically want to make lists of. And for the domain of computer science, where we currently have most users, we also offer the possibility to do benchmarks there. And we are constantly improving and developing really new features there. Um, the ORKG is um, thereby um, really committed to openness. So we are an open source, open data and uh, open science platform. And um, our content is citable and can be provided with a DOI if the creator of the content wishes to. Okay, the current status of the system is that we have around uh, 10,000 papers described in this uh, machine uh, actionable way. We have around 700 of those comparisons um, for 4,500 documented research problems, and we have around 80 users. And if you say, okay, this is not as much, um, this could be more, you are absolutely right. Um, if you think of all the articles that are out there, 10,000 described papers is really not that much, and we want to increase that. So the question is, who could increase the number? Who creates content here? And the answer is basically everyone can create um, content. Everyone can create, edit, add, reuse for their own purposes, complement uh, content. Uh, so basically the ORKG is a really community project where we would have um, input from um, IT specialists, software developers who then develop um, the ORKG. We would need uh, in, um, input from data specialists, um, the whole library community basically, um, and of course from actual um, scientists and domain specialists working on the different fields there. And um, as you can see, I already uh, put library communities there because, um, and with that, I especially mean university and scientific libraries, because they have always supported researchers in doing their work. And we as libraries uh, will continue to do so in the digital age and really help with those new digital challenges. For example, then with the ORKG. And um, for this, we need really the help of university libraries um, and university library communities and their services. So for example, um, it would be of great help to establish collaborations and integrate already existing services. So for example, terminology services um, or something like that. Um, it would be really helpful um, if there are existing uh, ontologies and standards that we can use, or if ontologies and standards are developed at university or scientific libraries, um, to integrate them to our KG, this would be really of help to us. Um, yeah, then of course, um, the actual content curation would be helpful because, uh, yeah, libraries are, of course, expert in content curation also. Um, so basically creating content, doing a quality control, for example, uh, organized in such an ORKG observatory would be great, where this uh, ORKG observatories are basically um, just uh, set up for specific research fields. And then um, people with a specialization in this research fields can then curate content towards this specific research problems there. Um, then, of course, also the promotion of the ORKG to your scientists that already use your services that come to your libraries would be valuable for us as well. Then, um, so basically, there are a lot of ways um, that uh, in which we need the help of library communities and services. And for that, we hope to establish uh, more collaborations in the future. Um, so basically, if you are interested or have an idea or something that you want to do with ORKG or that we can maybe also do for your library and your services, um, feel free to contact us anytime. Um, you have our website here, our email address. Um, you could also follow us on Twitter to um, get 
the newest updates basically of what is going on in the RKG. Yeah. And um, yeah, we really hope to establish further collaborations and also onboard a lot of university and scientific libraries to our program there. So then uh, on behalf of our whole team, you can see that we are already a quite large team and we are also still growing. Um, I would like to thank um, every one of you for your attention. Um, and with this, um, I am at the end of my talk. To summarize everything, um, we need to rethink scholarly communication to deal with uh, the problems of um, the digital age, like for example, the um, current publication flood. Um, for that, we need to make knowledge human and machine interpretable and actionable um, with knowledge graphs. And for content curation, we rely on a crowd-based approach um, where a combination of domain experts, data curators, librarians is needed to really get uh, content to the RKG. And then you can really help us with uh, integrating your existing services and getting involved, for example, with an RKG observatory uh, on a specific topic. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of my talk and thanks all for your attention. Thank you, Annalena Lorenz, for your interesting presentation. Um, we will come now to the, our third uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Plato uh, Smith uh, from University of Florida. His work is titled uh, Leveraging Social Technical Collaborations to Support Researcher, Researchers at the University of Florida. Dr. Plato Smith assists in the development of social technical people policies, technologies relationships with diverse stakeholders and shares the data management and uh, curation working group at University of Florida. Prior to joining University of Florida in 2016, Plato completed the 2013 and uh, 2016 um, uh, CLR our postdoctoral fellowship program in the data curation at the University of New Mexico. He received his doctorate uh, in the field of information science from the School of Information within the College of Communication and Information at Florida State University, Florida's high school in summer 2014. Help me now uh, welcome to the stage Plato Smith. Thank you. Uh, my name is Plato Smith, data management librarian at the University of Florida. The presentation will briefly highlight some efforts in which the library's data management support service is collaborating with units across campus to further develop research support services for researchers. Here's just a brief uh, snapshot of University of Florida established 1853. It's a research one institution. We have over 54,000 students, over 5,000 faculty located in Gainesville, Florida, United States of America, and as part of the State University System of Florida. Here are two quotes to frame the context of this presentation. The first quote is an unsolicited comment from an assistant dean in response to a recent announcement of a scheduled meeting with select key stakeholders on June 23rd of this year to discuss developing a business model approach to support institutional-wide electronic lab notebook solutions. The second quote is from Leeds University Business School Socio-Technical Center resource on social on social technical systems theory in support of a social technical approach to better understanding research data management within an organization. Here's just a brief uh, table of content. Here is just a, a brief snapshot. Um, of the progression of electronic lab notebook conversation uh, here at UF. I had a, a survey in 2020 exploring electronic lab notebooks. It's also referred to as electronic research notebook. A report and recommendations was submitted to senior stakeholders in 2020. An interesting inquiry from an associate professor of Heidelberg University asked uh, the libraries uh, what electronic lab notebook infrastructure was in place. Uh, which started um, a good um, uh, good conversation. This researcher was recruited by University of Florida Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. I, in turn, uh, suggested that he submit an integrated risk management fast pass solution risk assessment for open data 
for eLab Journal, which he did in 2021. 2022, um, the library's led uh, R Space research. Uh, R Space is an electronic lab notebook demo, invited a researcher who in turn um, invited her whole lab, which was very good. And any, anytime any institution is thinking about any type of electronic lab notebook, definitely need uh, the researchers involved as opposed to just a top down approach to uh, a solution. Uh, R Space was submitted risk management fast pass solution for uh, open data. Um, so as vetted, uh, senior stakeholders request an ELN solution that was recent within the past uh, week. The libraries facilitated price quotes for three ELNs between uh, last Friday and yesterday. And currently, uh, there's an ELN scope draft submitted to the VPR research, which was submitted last week. And later today, um, organized an informal meetup at the 17th International Digital Creation Conference, which is going on right now in parallel in Edinburgh. So, attending two international conferences at once. <clears throat> Here's a socio-technical systems theory approach uh, includes focus on critical subsystems of a social system in which the members form relationships through activities in a technical system where they perform a series of tasks related to specific goals. Organizational change program objectives met by joint optimization of the social and technical aspects of a system embedded within an external environment, as illustrated in figure one. As you can see, um, it's good to identify the key stakeholders and identify capacity, research data management capacity, infrastructure, resources, and policy. And out of the, the outer circle, as you can see the stakeholders, you see financial, economic uh, circumstances, basically the benefits, costs, cost for recovery, and return on investment. That has been the central theme across three international conferences I've attended within the past six days is basically the cost, stakeholders, capacity, infrastructure, resources, policy. Um, who's gonna pay for it? <clears throat> From 2016 to 2018, early data management planning, training workshops for faculty, students, and staff developed the foundation for the first data symposium in 2018 which was attended by nearly 100 faculty, students, and staff across campus. In December 2018, the libraries collaborated with the University of Florida Center for Environmental and Human Toxicology on a $13 million National Institutes of Health grant, Superfund grant, which required a data management analysis core, which was the first time it required uh, a data management analysis core for that pr program solicitation in 2018. The grant influenced development of a research data management task force charged with developing a university-wide research data management policy. The first draft was developed in 2019, led by research computing. In May 12, 2021, the libraries initiated a meeting to continue developing university-wide research data management policy draft here at UF. And this is 2021 and 2022, currently, um, um, uh, we have a proposal that's currently in review for Health and Human Services to develop a infrastructure to support electronic lab notebooks here at UF. Uh, UF was invited, um, well, submitted application and was received for a CNI Executive Roundtable on Data Science as research support service in the role of the libraries. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's an ELN business meeting uh, to develop um, model support for institution-wide uh, research lab, lab notebook on coming up uh, June 23rd. So in summer 2021, a faculty researcher recruited by University of Florida from Heidelberg University contacted libraries inquiring about institution-wide support of ELN at, at, at UF. Figure three illustrates the dashboard of eLab Journal, which was supplied by eLab Journal um, for contribution to an accepted uh, journal article currently in revision and digital library uh, perspective. Um, as you can see by the dates, uh, the faculty contacted UF, uh, we responded. Uh, the dashboard, as you can see, shows protocols, inventory, projects, and add-on. Uh, the libraries has received several requests for institutional-wide uh, electronic lab notebook uh, over the past uh, several weeks. <clears throat> 
Currently, a U.S. Department of Health and Human Service grant proposal pending sponsor review attempts to address some of these challenges of developing a data management illustrated um, in the socio-technical system framework via investment and in infrastructure. The proposal pending review is an active example of research support services funding related to grant proposal to support researchers and then the cost for institutional support written to a grant budget. So the proposal um, has funding to support a fixed share institutional uh, data repository. Currently, UF does not have a, a data repository. So this proposal would um, pilot a two-year uh, implementation of fixed share. Currently, we have researchers that use open science framework, uh, either the paid version or um, the free version. So this proposal will uh, provide institutional support um, which would increase uh, the features of Open Science Framework, then also select ELN notebooks, and then protocols IO. <clears throat> so here's the di diagram of the proposed uh, project and its ecosystem. Um, the proposal also includes uh, for several uh, city courses, and city stands for Collaborative Institutional Training Initiative, specifically related to teaching and developing good laboratory practices. So research design course provides learners with introduction to research study design, a detailed overview of scientific inquiry, examples of various research designs, a discussion of data management methods, an introduction to statistical analysis and sound approaches to optimize the reproducibility of research results. Good laboratory practice describes how non-clinical laboratory studies should be planned, performed, monitored, recorded, reported and archived as set forth by US FDA, EPA, USDA, and Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development International Guidelines. Data management security for student researchers and overview. This presentation provides an overview of data management and security for student researchers at the graduate level and discusses best practices to use in secure and research data. Responsible conduct of research. This course consists of basic course, uh, additional content that can be incorporated based on organizational and learner needs and a refresher course, which reemphasizes and expands on key concept. It is suitable for any person involved in research ranging from upper level undergraduates to established faculty. False Claims Act, a primer and guide for research organization. Organizations as well as individual researchers may face, may face stiff penalties under the False Claims Act for, prob for problems and grant applications and reporting. As awardees of federal funds and the entities bound to comply with grant terms and conditions, individuals and organizations need to understand how the FCA works and what risks it poses. This course provides critical training to individuals and research organizations on FCA and civil monetary penalties. It begins with the purpose of the laws, explains when liability attaches, discusses the consequences and potential penalties if violations occurs, and provides examples of recent FCA settlements between research organization and the US federal government. So figure four shows the proposal would pay for these, current, these courses, which currently are not um, available at UF. And as you can see by the, the price, they're relatively low. Uh, Built on top of the courses, then you have the fixed share data repository implementation, protocols IO at enterprise level, fixed share enterprise level, open science framework enterprise level, and then also uh, 10 licenses to pilot R space over a two year period. These courses were vetted through the Boulant Lab. Uh, this is the researcher who was uh, recruited from Heidelberg University. In turn, I searched the city program. Uh, came up with these courses, shared it with the Boulant Lab, and he agreed that these five courses uh, would be beneficial to student and, and faculty uh, in promoting good laboratory practices. Here are two research questions, uh, part of the, the grant proposal. Um, what constitutes good laboratory practice in the conduct of research? How can an ELN ecosystem support research related to ensuring research integrity, including good laboratory practices from a data point of view. Figure five shows the R space uh, ecosystem. As you can see, it integrates with um, 
uh, many existing uh, products, uh, productivity products that researchers use, such as Google Drive, Dropbox, Box. As you can see, it integrates with uh, protocols, I.O. Then also you have Dataverse, Figshare, as far as archiving and storage. So the recommendation for any institution thinking about electronic lab notebook, possibly just like Harvard uh, uh, Medical School, uh, which uh, the Cori Lab supports too. One is for all disciplines, which would be like our space, and then the life science, uh, something specific, which would be an uh, eLab journal. And I'm not endorsing, it's just uh, you want to have one ELN that's for all disciplines, and then you have uh, it's more specific. There is not one size fit all. <clears throat> Here's just some few highlights on early work, um, 2017 survey. Uh, investigating data assets and management. Uh, 2020 uh, survey electronic lab notebook, the top primary affiliations, uh, agriculture and life science, medicine, engineering. These also the top three um, academic uh, units for research uh, awards, uh, according to the annual report uh, by UF Research 2021. And then the last column, you see um, ARC student hypergator access uh, which is a student program, a, co a collaboration between the libraries and information technology to provide access to the Hypergator cluster for students uh, that do not have that do not have funding uh, to pay for those uh, high performance computing um, services. And then um, let's see. And here's some acknowledgments. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Plato Smith, for your interesting uh, contribution. We have now uh, 15 minutes for question. Um, do you have, do we have questions in the audience? Uh, starting with uh, Mr. Smith, I see you are busy with the approval process for a research data management policy. And I was just wondering, uh, what the interface uh, may be with um, an open science policy. Okay, for the first question, university policy, thank you for your question. Uh, the university policy draft in 2019 led by research computing, also clinical translational science institute and the libraries is currently in draft. Um, and so as some of my colleagues have told me and, and we are experiencing this here at UF, a university-wide research data management policy normally takes several years uh, to develop. Currently, we have senior stakeholders involved, but it's just a long process to um, get to a point where the policy is um, approved and implemented. The, U the University of Edinburgh uh, recently released their university-wide uh, research data management policy. As part of our fact-finding, uh, the task force we did um, review the policy or at least acquire the policies of peer institutions that are ranked above uh, UF, according to the annual report in which the director of um, research computing said uh, that was a, that's a good approach. So we're still developing, it's still in draft form. There are many, uh, many stakeholders, key stakeholders involved, uh, but it's just a long process. Um, I wish I had a more concrete answer, but the libraries is a stakeholder that's at the table and is contributing content and support and research uh, for university-wide uh, data policy. Um, and that came as a result of a researcher going for a $13 million grant and it was having uh, difficulty uh, coming up with the resources as far as uh, basically the aggregation of resources to support such a large uh, grant proposal. So that was basically like the straw that broke the camel's back the data management analysis core requirement by NIH in 2018 really was the catalyst to push UF to in pursuit of a university-wide data management policy, which is still in development uh, with many stakeholders across multiple units. So yeah, thank you. I have a question for Amalema Lawrence. I think you are totally right that uh, scientific articles will look uh, different in the future and there is a need that they will be uh, that there will be a change in how we use uh, scientific articles but all the big uh, IT companies now are working with uh, models for language processing using artificial intelligence and I, I know there are 
different uh, difficulties with processing scientific uh, uh, language, but uh, some have the idea that you can ask and get uh, not 30 summaries from articles, but get a new article based, written by the machine, based on a whole lot of other articles and data sets. But you seem to, to choose a totally different uh, approach with your model. Okay, um, so basically, um, yes, you are, you are right. Um, and um, like, um, I, I guess I had it on one slide, this question answering where you basically would have a new um, article consisting of information from different articles uh, would definitely be, um, be a thing to uh, look into into the future. Um, but for um, a completely automated system, um, the technology currently just isn't there. So. Um, if you have machine learning um, on scientific articles, they can uh, give you, um, so machine learning techniques can give you a rough estimate, for example, um, in which uh, domain this uh, article falls. But if you are really, for example, interested in the actual results, so what's actually the result of the paper, um, there's only very, very limited ways to um, apply machine learning and artificial intelligence there. Um, I guess there have been experiments um, with papers that are following a really concrete um, specific structure. And then from these uh, papers, there were results um, extracted and only a really specific type of result that was um, taken from all of those papers. And uh, even then, it had uh, not too good accuracy there. So even then in this really specific case where the papers had a specific structure and also the results um, were specifically defined. So what do the results look like was defined. And even in that case, um, the outcome was in a way that uh, humans still had to look at it and uh, to um, yeah correct a bit by hand, even in this very, very um, specified and limited uh, application. So if you think of all scholarly um, content, you have articles that are written in really different ways where you don't really sometimes know what the result will look like. Will it be a, a qualitative statement, something quantitative? So if you want to really go to the whole um, science currently, there is no way uh, around human cur curation there. I know it's the dream and the promise of many platforms to completely um, do everything um, automatically with uh, machine learning and AI. Um, but currently the technology is only limited and um, it will not produce the results that are wanted there. So we have a question from the uh, chat, please. Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have a question from Susanna Stosika from the Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information. This is a question for Christina. Ready? Okay. Um, she was, uh, Su uh, Susanna was uh, inspired and she's looking forward to reading your education resources. She wants to ask, if you don't support the creation of any journal lists, how can institutions make sure that scientists are not rewarded for predatory publishing in evaluation systems? How can the system sort out predatory publications from honest ones? I'm not sure. We know that the system is not completely good and uh, we have to find another way how to solve it. Uh, the problem with lists are, is that list has to be updated all the time and we are unable to keep it updated. A journal could be completely fine in 2022 and then change the owner and get worse. And that's, that's the problem. And it was the problem uh, even for the scientists, they focus on it in our discussion and we hopefully find a way how to do it. I think that the best way now is to educate each scientist so he could make the decision, the 
good decision because it's their renome that their reputation what is put in in risk. Um, the other question to the second presenter um, related to what she said in terms of uh, the support provided by libraries uh, for research and researchers. And, and, and she said, we have been providing support and we can continue to do so. So the question was, are there any changes in the um, um, form, scale and pace um, by which libraries support research and researchers? Okay, um, so basically I do see a change there um, in the way that we can support researchers because um, the whole digitalization brought um, a broad range of new issues like, for example, um, it's not that much of a problem anymore to find articles about a certain subject, but um, the organization of those articles in a way that makes it possible to get the information out of all those articles, for example, is a new challenge. Then also um, this um, data management completely has a new relevance in a time where we can really do big data analysis in science. So this whole data management also is then a new challenge there for libraries. So a lot of the old and kind of traditional um, responsibilities of a library stay. Um, but there are also then new responsibilities on top of it and um, but a lot of skills that are present in libraries can be transferred to this um, new digital challenges and can be applied there. Um, so for example, um, this, uh, for example, um, keywords, ontologies, everything, all of this is needed in new, um, new formats, new digital formats and um, yeah, I guess really the responsibility for libraries is now to stay updated to what are the new challenges in the digital age and um, like the transformation to digital age is kind of also the responsibility for libraries now. Maybe this goes into the direction of the question. Uh, thank you to our presenters uh, and to our audience, both in person and virtually.